Okay. We're live. You can go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Sorry for the little delay. We were having sort of bandwidth issues, Facebook uploading issues, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm Shudeep Sen. I'm sitting in Delhi. It's um, 9.41 at night. And Fiona? I am sitting on the borders of Wales and England, and it's 4.15 in the afternoon. Welcome. This is just a, a, a sort of a pre-show for our 2021 season, which will be in a different format. Um, uh, Fiona will tell you a little bit more about it. Yes, we're going to meet on the second Tuesday of every month, just like this, at this time, only 10 minutes earlier. And each time we will be inviting around three poets to read in more depth. We'll be interviewing them a little, and there will also be a critical discussion of their work very unusually. So those will be free events, conclave we call ourselves, um, for an hour and a half every second Tuesday of the month. Fantastic. So this is just a party. So this is to raise your glass, schlange, cheers. Yes. I think it's tea time for a lot of people. It's midnight for, it's midnight for Edwin who's sitting in Kuala Lumpur. And um, yes, so today will be a salon type affair with chat and with readings and so on. So I think it's best if Fiona, maybe you can start off with the poem. I'll be glad to start. I think we are, san uh, we are sandwiching you today, I think. I'm starting and Sadiq, Shadeep is finishing. So this poem is almost seasonal, not that it is snowing here yet. Numenon. Snow falls and fills a valley. And under its white roof, a sleeper dreams snow is falling secretly for her alone. On and on in darkness, it falls like something speaking noiselessly into silence. Something that's all alone in silence, can't hear itself, can't feel grass or stones or the small branches it conceals, even in the sleeper's dreams, falling snow cannot feel the world it longs to touch and misses, falling through its own cold embrace on and on in the dark. The sleeper dreams snow is falling on her pillow as wide, wet words. The night speaks about itself. Snow, speaking the words for night. Are we reading a couple of poems or are we reading one, Sadiq? Yeah, read another one, a couple of poems at least. So this <clears throat> is the nature of Gothic. I've spent far too long recently thinking about Gothic with a K because I wrote a biography of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein and so on. But this is the other kind of Gothic. This is medieval, churches and cathedrals. I'm obsessed by these buildings. The nature of Gothic. What does it want, this cool stone span, this bridge on air? What does it ask of us who come questioning, who move round its feet, our voices licking at space, our desires make currents stir all up the air that asks us to see something wonderful, the roof of the world perhaps, expects some gravity to open in us, reflection or answer, but stone shifts endlessly into itself. It disappears and reappears like hours that slip out of mind, then reappear having been lost to us while we were lost among the forest's pillars. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first reader, Indran. As last time, Shadeep is writing everyone's bio notes up in chat so we don't have to do those awful, slightly dehumanizing but incredibly impressive introductions. They're all on the chat. 
Um, and I also want to quickly say, you know, let's all applaud Don as we go each time because it's so fantastic that he's made, enabled this event for us. So this is my thank you for, to Don and Indran, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much Fiona and Sadeep. Um, Indran, I'm Thanagam, I'm based in Washington DC, just outside of DC. And uh, I'll read a couple of poems from my latest book, The Migrant States. Um, the book, there's a dialogue with Walt Whitman throughout the book, uh, several poems where Walt is a character. And on his 200th birthday, I wrote this poem. This was last year, Walt 200. Break the locks, unleash the mind. Walt Whitman has left Pomanoc. He is abroad. He is sitting among us in our soul. He flies the post with pigeons and the giant freight planes. He hops freight trains and rides into Mexico. He's on a P&O cruise visiting St. Kitts and Barbados. He has joined the merchant marine. He sails into Guantanamo. He throws fish into the sea in search of whales. He has the biggest, longest beard in the world. He jives, thrives, cavorts, shimmers. He is 200 years old today and he does not give a flying rat. He's in your mind, Mr. President, even if you cannot smother or scratch or squeeze him out. He is gloriously spirit, gadfly, rabbit and sloth. He nurses our democratic wounds. He knows how to write history from the pebbles view, the side glance of the wren, the snake hanging in the tree. He is black and white and all shades of gray. He is our friend and guide and he will elect us every time we fall down. Let us go back to Pomanoc with what we've learned these 200 years. Let us go back to set forth again, Walt Whitman in our backpack. So Walt Whitman born again in this new America that we're now celebrating here, despite the terrible ravages of the, the pandemic. Um, I'll read a, a poem for, I wrote many years ago for my son uh, when he was much younger. Uh, the night before he was uh, to, to take a plane. The poem is called Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now and I am sad and the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories alive. And you ask dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turned red and yellow and the morning bristled and the sun seared yet left your skin cold? A cold sun, Dad. I feel it too. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash. And what's to do? Yes, write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed and know there's no morning flight and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. Thank you very much, Indra and Amit Naik. Thank you, thank you, Fiona and Sadeep. For <clears throat> wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Indran and, Indra and I go back a long, long time. Um, um, I think, what, 1989 is when we first met. Right. So right. We were in New York. He was at Columbia School of Journalism a few years before I was. And then we, of course, started a reading series in my flat, which previewed a few days ago. So thank you, Indran, for being here. It's also so lovely to see so many friends here, people I haven't seen for 20 years, 15 years. It's fabulous. It's really fabulous that we can bring so many people together. The one I can't vouch for people's personalities or traits, but one thing I can vouch for is they are bloody good writers, all of them. And that's what unites us. Unites us. So I think now we will have the so man from the top of the Balkan peak. <laughs> Zoran Anchevsky, it's a real great pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome. I know that study of yours. I've spent many, many, um, many a day trying to connect to internet, talk, trying to talk to my son. Those days bandwidth issues were even, 
I don't know, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Zoran joins us from uh, Skopje in Macedonia. He is also, apart from being an excellent poet and translator, one of the main translators actually from, from that region is translated Thomas Tronstammer, Ted Hughes. I mean, you name all the big poets, he's done it. And well, and I'd like to say Bill Merwin, who's one of my total heroes and who I finally met and who Zoran translated and who I finally met when Zoran had him as the Struger laureate and um, was yeah. fantastic. And in fact, it's through Zoran Shadik that you and I met because we met at Struger. That's yeah. right. Yes, of course, we met at Struga. So yeah. we at, Zoran and at, at the time, it was Zoran who was directing the festival. Yes. So Zoran, exactly. we thank you for Fiona's and my friendship. That's where it began. Well, thank you very much for the warm yeah, welcome. Ago. Yeah, it was years ago when I was uh, much younger and full of ideas and ambitions to make this festival uh, even better than it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, and uh, and uh, of course, I did invite young upcoming poets then, now very much established in all realms of, uh, of uh, I don't know, criticism, poetry, theory, whatever, literary science, etc. Et and I'm very uh, glad to see you all here. And I would like to thank you for inviting me. And I do hope that these bad times of uh, this COVID human adventure will come to an end and we'll uh, still have the uh, possibility to come together at festivals, including our own Macedonian, one of the best in the world, Struga Poetry Festival. And of course, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, time that we haven't met, I, I uh, uh, continued working and uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2018, I published a book, a new book of poems called... Show it, show it. Yeah, Celestial Pantomime. I don't know. It's, it's a very, very sort of minimalist cover. Mm. <laughs> there it is. And uh, uh, it received the National Poetry Award. And last year it was published in English, my translation. And I worked together with a fellow poet. Uh, of Macedonian origin, who lives in Australia, Tom Petsinis. Mm -hmm. You might uh, have uh, read him both as a prose writer and as, as an excellent poet. So he edited my translations into English. So I'm going to start reading from this book. Uh, actually, there is a sequence of poems there inspired by Dante's La Vita Nuova. Uh, it has nothing to do with real Dante's La Vita Nuova, but it's, uh, it's an experiment of of seeing my, or seeing again, uh, what I missed in life and what still uh, uh, sort of possible to do in order to, uh, to, to, to improve or worsen my, my memories of my previous life. All right, La Vita Nuova, uh, part one, and I'm going to read part five from this sequence of poems. And then perhaps I'm going to read two shorter poems. One, which comes from the experience of working on translation with Shudip Sen uh, some 10 years ago when he came to Macedonia and we did, we polished up a poem that I translated, which is called Translation. So, La Vita Nuova. It's too simple to surrender to the wind in an hour when nothing changes. In a moment when you might say, I was born in a cradle that suffered from worm-eaten images. I grew up in years that rose from the bunkers of rebels' tales, beyond the visions of wise men who once knew the formula of passion. I matured in the secret of human pain, in the silent growth of kingdoms along the extending world's ways, that even now, as I grow old, take my breath away and the right to a failing future that leaves only an inheritance of scars. Now you write the scriptures of fallen belfries and minarets, of nocturnal houses over thick sheet music of smoke. Your best readers are doctors of silence, executed long ago by a barrage of solid proof, falsely nestled 
between time's overlapping hands and the infinite reflected in the mirrors of crossroads. So if you begin your exchange with the past at an untimely hour, do not cross a river that flows backward from the sea. The unclaimed signs, sighs of youth light vain fires in old age. They confirm the meaning of winter and the bare trees against sunset. When the waters you cross lack the bitterness of salt, you will wake in a nightmare dripping from an evil bearing tree. To begin your exchange with the future, right on time, you need to bathe in a river that flows forward to the sea. Wading in it, remember me as someone who woke up in a new skin, taught as tanned shadow, who finally did something real, multiplied in infinite images at the crossroad of sea waves that shape divine holes with wild mirrors. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, the second one is for the free-minded. Uh, that's actually the uh, uh, poem, which uh, is a kind of a, uh, an epigraph to the whole book. And it's uh, called Wild Horses. Wild horses don't carry messages on the bloodstained paths of war, but gallop proudly beyond battles, despising the haughty knights the emblems on their shields, the symbols on flags and helmets, their scornful of spoiled ladies waving skilled scarves in greeting the dead. Wild horses yearn sunset's embrace and the softness of the strawway stretching to an Elysian twilight. They canter lightly, steady paced, to perform their masterful celestial pantomime. Their hooves spark with tiny stars. The Milky Way unfurls from their manes, weaving the history of the wind on the loom of a dark universe. They look down on walls from the crossroads of constellations. Thank you. And finally, this is an older poem, but in uh, memory of our cooperation uh, with Shudip Sen, I will read this one as well. And actually, it, 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 it's, it, it's something that comes from uh, uh, almost, a, let's say, lifelong experience with translation. It's called simply translation. Word by word, I translate the dead into living bones into meat, winters into summers, molehills into mountains. I shed the snake's skin, tailor angel's wings. I'm the word's judge who remains unseen within the text. I sleep on a pillow of someone else's dreams. I wake up to a good morning in dead tongues. I translate day into night, the past into present, oblivion into memory, today into tomorrow, but did not anticipate the cruel desiccating act, the fact that with every translated breath I lose my very own, spend myself, waste myself unknowingly, floating word by word into another context. So now I'm expected to transport the thirsty across the river without getting wet, without being quenched. I neither have the breath, no words, no hands to translate my own pain into sadness, happiness, plenitude. Stop. Enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Oh my you. Lord, that's so stunning, but so ambivalent about translation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it will raise some discussion later. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's not a bad poem, Zoran. I remember oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the help. You, you, remember you, you must that. remember it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I remember how how difficult it was to translate. We sat, of course, sat together because yeah. to get the cadence and the texture of the Macedonian, uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the the way the Cyrillic tra transfers into the English, it's a tough thing. Yeah, uh, it's, but it's, it's, I think, it's I think we got it. We got it. Yeah, thank I you. think we got it. Yeah, because. Uh, to, the the most difficult thing to translate is the rhythm and I would say the cultural issues there, you know. And I think we managed to do the rhythm, uh, whereas translation as a cultural issue is common, it's universal. So I think we did a good job. Yes, but Fiona was right. It is indeed about the ambivalence of translation. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And now we have fabulous dear Magda. It is indeed about the ambivalence of translating, about spending yourself at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasting, wasting. <laughs> <laughs> so can we welcome Magda from Bucharest, one of the finest? Well, there are so many one of the finest here. Yeah. <laughs> so she's yet one of the finest of the lot. She's from Bucharest and her bio is on the chat box. And if Fiona wants to say something, please, she is a common friend of ours. Yes, Magda Konec is an early heroine of mine who I met on my first trip to Romania, I think, when she was very um, welcoming and just allowed me to ask lots of questions about Romanian writers and culture. And uh, over the years I've read, I can only obviously read English and French and kind of guess at the Romanian, but I've read so much of Magda's work, not only her poetry, but her prose, her fiction, her wonderful new, um, I don't really know what to call it because it's a hybrid genre um, piece just translated, her art theory. I mean, Magda's a kind of towering cultural figure, I think, as well as a towering poet. She was, of course, the cultural attache in Paris. She's a head of pen in Romania. I mean, so many amazing contributions to culture and it's just real joy always to see and hear her. Um, and it's an honor too. Magda, all yours. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona and Shudeep for this invitation, which made me great pleasure. And I think this is one of the, the, the good effects that the pandemic brought uh, about this um, uh, Zoom meetings uh, for, with people from all over the world. And this is really extraordinary. And I, I hope this will continue, will go on after the pandemic ends. Um, uh, Magda, may I just interrupt one thing? You know, one of the things I do want to say, and I, I think um, uh, Fiona will agree, and all of us will agree, the, the, the structure of what we are trying to do is to keep it intimate and have poets who want to really listen to poetry rather than having huge audiences, though that will happen automatically because Don is very good in terms of streaming it to various places. But just to have a close intimacy of listening to good poetry, that's okay. part of the limit. Okay, uh, tell me please, will we uh, read the once more or just once? Just the once, Magda. Just once. So please do read both your poems now because, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I will read the two or three poems from this uh, book of um, mine, which is an older one, but I, um, I think it's a good one. And uh, it was published in the United States uh, 10 years ago or so. And I chose some poems about women. I don't know why, probably because we are less women in this conclave now for the time being. So, Hyacintha. Her name was Hyacintha, Yachinta, name of the spicy flower of spring, unfortunate melancholy ephib, diffusing his unripe blood throughout the countryside a name of a Christian martyr. Her name was Yachinta, 
how strange, hyacinth. I was exalted as if from breathing in her perfume suffused in chloroform. Her name was Hyacintha, but she ignored everything and cared for nothing. She lay in the white hospital bed, had four children, didn't know anything about sex, genitals, cycles, pills, all those mysterious things. She was sallow and thin, had straw-colored hair, almost a peasant, was afraid of the lancet and of blood, desired to have no more children. I asked her, do you know how it feels to be a hyacinth? Yachinta looked at me, startled. She lay in the white hospital bed, terrorized by her very body, ashamed. Just because her name was Hyacintha, Yachinta, spicy flower of spring plucked from snow-covered fields, handsome ill-fated Ephib, immaculate Christian martyr. I taught her about genitals, cycles, and pills. In the bed full of hyacinth flowers, I helped her to disseminate her blood otherwise. The second poem is from a political cycle and it um, relates to a specific experience that people had in a communist country. The labors of Aphrodite. As morning comes howling, its light scorch poised above each couple white floating on the waters of the bed Millions of warm bodies whitely entangled in love with the despair of the end predestined to the eternal work day, drenched in the cold sweat of dawn, body to body, in the big body of the universe predestined to the eternal work day, the blood drawn from the blood packaging factories still trickles under the black iron gates and penetrates with slender streaks early the city predestined to the eternal work day. <clears throat> the whistle of the siren is ever more shrill, ever more shrill, but nobody seems to be waking up yet from the noise of the slaughterhouses for cannon fodder predestined to the eternal work day. The labors of Aphrodite, the labors of a body next to a body, body to body toiling for the still soft and unknown form of a future new man, now being begotten by each couple violently plunged into love with the despair of the end. And he, the wet and holy baby, the great baby will come humble and silent, raped in newspapers, unheralded, a package abandoned near the door, near the milk bottle, like a universal preserve filled with hope and apocalypse that will feed all mouth to satiety, all brains, all the bodies greedily entangled in love, drenched in the cold sweat of dawn, blinded by the ecstasy, terror, and fury, predestined to the eternal work day. Thank you. If it's... If it's possible, I can read one more poem. The Man of Your Life. You hear a voice in a store, 
Your involuntary meet a gaze that astounds you, touches you to your inmost depths, and suddenly you are sure, you know with your whole being, you've come across the man of your life. The man long awaited, always sought, who finally has been sent to you when you no longer thought it possible. And of course, at that very moment, you're bone tired, you've no makeup on, your hair's not unwashed, you're in a t-shirt and jeans. In the straw's hubbub, you remain planted in one spot, trying to think a solution. Secretly, you take a peek at the man. He's looking for a product, preoccupied. He doesn't see you. But you know, deep down inside, he's the man of your life. You feel without understanding, you divine a transfiguration. Something magnetic holds you, invisibly attracts you to him. You try to find a way, an approach. You pretend you're also looking for the same item too but already the man of your life has moved on. Wordlessly, you follow him. You haven't even had a good look at his face, but his allure, even from behind him, enigmatically tells you without a doubt, he's the man of your life. You fix your eyes on him, but he feels nothing and your exhaustion grows stronger and stronger. A sort of sleep settles heavily on your brain. You yawn and feel like stretching out across the floor. An abyss has opened up inside you. He is the man of your life, but he doesn't know it, doesn't feel it, and you weren't ready. You were asleep. You'd lost any hope. His gaze touched you to your death. It confirmed in you a complete absurd certainty. Overwhelming joy is possible. Perfection is possible. He's the man of your life, the long imagined man. Your constricted heart ages and you would speak. You find no words. Everything seems so ridiculous. You follow a short distance behind him and suddenly you remember the parable of the five foolish virgins in the gospels who forgot to wait for the marvelous groom with their lamps lit and full when he came unexpectedly and broke their hearts. Now you know, and with your chest in flames, but mute like a nation shadow from the beyond, you follow the one who rapidly moves away through the store without your being able to call out to him. You, you're the man of my life. You're my infinite, my fulfillment. Together we are boundlessness, we are perfection. I waited for you as long as I could. I prepared myself as well as I could. I forgot, I remembered, then I forgot again. I don't want to lose you. You're the glory of the world. Now you're here. Come to me. Oh, come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manda. Beautiful. Well, not to listen to it too without smiling with recognition. <laughs> yes, because, you know, once it was, I know these poems, some of them. Well, yes, yeah, but also the situations. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the first one was from Cosmos, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. So, Bengt, welcome. Finally, we've been able to get you in from Have the cold there. little village. <laughs> of Tursby, Tursby. So welcome, Bengt. Your um, um, bio is on the side. 
and it's all yours. Shall I read now? Yes, please. Welcome. And you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry for coming late. I had some problems with the communication. So deep now how I am living in the wilderness, in the darkness, in the forest, among the wolves. Okay, I will read a, a poem called Get Ready for a New Day. To think about love for a moment, know that road ends at the same place as it once began. Stand still, waiting for the rain, Look for a circle in the grass where we once stood. Cap your hand over that spot that's for pre protection. To think about love, know that rain will soon start to fall in a, an open hand. And then uh, another short on longing. He longed for outside's freedom. The child said, when I opened the window for the bird, where are the outsides, which makes our breast filled up with longing and the words which make language to something else other than words. Gracias. Banks, Banks, since you're reading very short poems, you can read two more short poems if you wish. I can read another. Yes. Shorter. Yes. A forest with only one single tree. It stands in the middle. Thank you. Bravo! Bravo, 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 bravo. Gracias. So now we have Tudo from Timishwara. Tudo Kreto from Timishwara. Welcome, Tudo. Order to... Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, but it's still a little bit broken up, Tudo. I can hear someone typing. Uh, nice. Can you hear? Okay. So, in order to make it safe, listen to it so that. The... Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to switch the video off and just listen to the text. It isn't just to make the, because the poem, as you said in the beginning, is more important than the poet, especially under, so to speak, this technical circumstances, given my, I don't know what kind of internet connections I have, because I, this is a problem I did not expect. The poem, nevertheless, I'm going to read is called Exorcism, and uh, uh, its translation was published in uh, the Romanian Riveter. So that's the first poem I'm going to read. Exorcism, this entity, Blind and swarthy, locomotive, cold steam, something stuck on the inside like a sticker, a wild beast chased away by the shovel with the shovel. Let me invoke it, spit it between the eyes. It is nothing but a ball of fur, a leper's green, a steam rising from a gory wound. Let me call it, hit it with the poker. We clash in gardens, in open air. Where are you? Come out. Where are you? Come out. A smell of charred cauldron, of a funny gypsy coppersmith, soot and ashes of an old hut. Come out, crawl and go back to the opened manhole. I shall poke the effigy deep in your flesh 
the effigy burning on the grill. I shall scorch your fur, your fat rolls. You will run like a mat, hit with an old shoe. Your hiss, louder than any break screech. Come out, this is a kind man's shelter. It is the Lord's house and the town in the postcards. Red candles burning instead of furnaces. You are a whirlpool, a toxin, deluge and tremor. Come out. These are the teachings on the whitest sheets of paper. Come out. Let me spit and wring my shirt, my dirty rags out. You do not exist. You do not exist. You do not exist. You are but a pain. I think Tudor's lost the connection. Can you hear me? Yes. We lost you after you do not exist. You do not exist. You do not exist. <laughs> we, we wipe our feet on. Come out. Shrink. Regal and spring out to my ears, my nostrils, or better my head. In that moment, under a ceiling covered in bronze candelabra, shining in broad daylight, daylight I'll stand smiling, fainting, and if need be of tremor, let it be now. And if need be of an earthquake, let the shore collapse now. And if need be of a fire, let my barn burn down now. It is the Lord's meadow here, and the Sundays have only mornings. Come out, the clean air will suffocate you. Come out, the women's scarves are all white. Come out, the sound of the keys is the invocation, the little hammer that drives you crazy, that flattens your skull. Come out of the smoker's lungs and the darkness of the smoking houses. Come out, you old hag, you shrew, wagging your tail. Leave a, a round hole behind you in the window, like a bullet, like a projectile. This is the house of the honeycombs and kindness, of plain garments and clean asses. Come out, you have come out. So this is the uh, the first uh, uh, the first poem. This is. Uh, I hope, nevertheless, you could. Can you hear me? But not now. Okay. Can you hear me? Short, short, Putin. Which yeah. are I'm going to turn off the images. The image. Okay. So this is part of a project called Putin, called Leader Postcards, which are in fact images, uh, picture poems. In fact, images taken from. Uh, poems inspired by images, by photographs from newspapers. Putin, what would you tell Vladimir, Put Vladimir Putin to the doggy you hold in your arms, the Saint Bernard puppy? Its sex still has a ribbon around it Ab about how to kill with the shashka or the bullet, about the mix mixture of sauerkraut juice and vodka and the intercostal space, the most frequently perforated interstice. What would you tell the dead fish that you feed to the dolphins, its, color, its colors fading one by one? But what would you tell the dolphin that you would probably shoot it in the head in the dismissive manner of a ticket collector or a ticket machine? 
Maybe you would munch a little. Your eyes would turn even bluer. You would feed the baby dolphins with the nuclear bottle. And now the second part of this poem. Putin, it's green paste, a bit tart, a bit acid. His spinach is brighter. His plate flashes like traffic lights. Putin is always extracting something, the white radish, the slice of. His cheekbones, when he threatens, lose their shape. His eyes are also traffic lights. Putin is a citric, cynical, old timer. He has his necks on large sterilized lenses. His sorrel is chopped with slightly sharper ones. Putin is medicinal. His sauerkraut juice lysergic. His buttons are moral too. Putin loves splitting watermelon. He shows his grandchildren the core, the blackest seeds. With his wet napkins, you can disinfect scalpels, battlefields, etc. Thank you, Tudor. Thank you very much. I hope that the, the perception of what well, the sound was clear, I mean. Indeed, yes, yes, it, yes. Could you hear me? That's the question, in fact. Yes, absolutely. Okay, then yes. that's the. I think, the I, think I, I think it's gone all the way to the Red Square. Yeah, okay, and thank you for listening also. Yes, thank you, Tudor, yes. So now we have Victor and Catherine, their bios, impressive bios are on the side. Their, Victor, of course, is a wonderful, wonderful poet. Catherine's a wonderful, wonderful translator. They're both scholars and academics. Everything about them is there, but they are an incredible husband and wife team. A rare combination in the world. When I first met Victor, he says, I'm the luckiest man alive because I have the best Spanish translator and I'm married to her. <laughs> <laughs> Sudeep, thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. And Take thank you for both. Thanks to Fiona and to Sudeep for having us here. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, it's a really a, a pleasure to be here. Well, we will, we will read uh, uh, just one poem, even fragments of uh, 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 one poem. And it's, it belongs to uh, uh, from, it's from a book that just came out, the English translation from the Red Barn. And it, the book was published in, 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 in Spanish in Spain uh, like seven years ago. And um, I prefer always to read my, my poems in Spanish and uh, uh, Kate will read the translation of these poems into English. Eh, desde un granero rojo. Hoy te ganas la vida vigilando. Well, let, let me say something. This, this, poem, this book is basically um, about my experience of being an immigrant in the United States. I came to the United States eh, 25 years ago, and with a wonderful fellowship from the University of Oregon. But after two weeks, the first two weeks here, I realized that the money was not enough and I had to find out a job. Of course, a, an under the table job. And I, uh, I grew up in Cuba in a farm. I was a farmer. No, uh, my first job, uh, and I have been trying to escape of being a farmer my entire life. And my first job in the United States was as a farmer. And basically, but the lesson is you cannot run away from your identity. You know, you will be what you are everywhere. Okay. 
desde un granero rojo. Hoy te ganas la vida vigilando la muerte de una vaca. La academia no da para el divorcio, menos para el amor. En el prado del sueño americano entre ortigas y zarzas se escucha solo el eco de la muerte que se esmera sin desfallecimiento. Paisano Baudelaire que rechina dientes en la tripa del libro ninguneado. Instrucciones escritas terminantes del dueño de la hacienda que ninguna criatura coma del animal sino la muerte misma. El coyote ya comenzó la ronda, su mirada destaza. Pronto vendrá el camión con el veterinario que certificará la defunción. La res y su música enrumbarán la planta de conservas para perro y podrás llegar a tiempo a la cita en la penumbra de la biblioteca o en las cuidadas frondas del cementerio que ni la muerte usa. Entre las espinas cuajan las vallas, los cardos aprovechan y florecen, puja el viento lanudo en los linderos marcados por el óxido. La brisa no sabe qué hacer con el ahorcado, se restriega en la lana del abrigo, los pantalones cortos de repente, ante la ya libre gravitación de las piernas, la hematoma en el rostro, las manos infructuosas, la honra del desnucada, no la intriga. Duda entre columpiarlo, mesar la cabellera, desollinar el ánima. Hay lagos que agitar, hojas que enrojecer, caballos que seguir en el galope. Ese cuerpo que han puesto en su camino no le corta el aliento. A plomo contra el norte se levanta el rumor cegado del maíz, arquea las columnas, desconcierta las vértebras y la luz agolpada temerosa de entrar por la sendija al granero repintado de rojo va a enredarse con mugidos de vaca, afilar las pupilas de quienes han desafiado la noche al resplandor de un sueño. Cuando el fuego termina su tarea, la ceniza se vuelve escalofrío, visión que no da sombra. Thanks, Victor. Um, I'm going to read uh, my translations now of, um, of this, uh, these first poems from the book, uh, From a Red Barn. Today you earn a living looking after the death of a cow. The academy can't afford the divorce, much less love. In the American dream meadow among nettles and blackberry bushes only to make out the echo of death. She goes to great pains unflinching. Fellow peasant Baudelaire grinds teeth in the innards of a book brushed aside, blunt directions written by the owner of the farm, for no creature to eat the animal but death herself. The coyote already makes its rounds, its glancing butchers. Soon the truck with the veterinarian will come to certify the expiration. The beast and its music will set off for the dog food factory, and you'll make it on time for the date in the library half light or in the carefully kept fronds of the cemetery death doesn't even put to use. Berries curdle on thorns, thistles make the most of it and flower. The woolly wind strains against the edges, streaked with rust. The breeze doesn't know what to do with the hanged man, rubs up against the coat wool, the pants suddenly short before the now free gravitation of legs. <clears throat> Bruise on his face, fruitless hands, broken neck, honor, don't intrigue her. She wavers between swinging him, pulling his hair, sweeping suit from his anima. There are lakes to rustle, leaves to redden, horses to follow in gallop. The body in her way doesn't leave her gasping for breath. 
Straight up against the north wind rises the cut corn murmur. Arches, columns, unsettles backbone. And light piled up frightened of falling through the cracks into the barn painted red over and over. It will get tangled in the cows mooing, sharpen the pupils of those who've challenged the night in a dream brightness. When fire finishes its task, ash turns to shiver, vision casts no shade. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sudib and, and, and thank you so much for the invitation. We will have to leave uh, five minutes to one because we have a faculty meeting. We are still teaching and we can be here like one hour more, but not more than that. I'm so sorry. Okay, if the reading go beyond that point, you know, uh, we apologize in advance, Case and me. Thank you so much. I completely understand. Yeah, me too. So we completely understand. Absolutely. And thank you for a wonderful poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Yuri, mucho gusto. <laughs> There are quite a lot of people here who understand Spanish. That's good, isn't it? Oh, that's Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So Richard Price from, from London. Richard, your bio is on the side. It's lovely to see you after so many years. A long, long time. Uh, Richard's <laughs> been a long time. Out. And we were part of a, a poetry workshop which, was, uh, which went on in London for the longest time. And in fact, we celebrated 25 years of, what is it called, the workshop? Um, I think it was, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. I don't think it had a name. I think that's just, it wasn't capital letters. It was just, oh, you're going to the workshop. <laughs> and it was, it had some wonderful, wonderful poets. Maybe I'll, I, I might even have the anthology here. I'll show it to you when he reads. Um, uh, Richard uh, publishes variously poetry, uh, short fiction, criticism. He's done extensive work in the little magazine uh, section. He's also working uh, at the British Library. You can read his bio on the side. And, and folks, please put your links and links to buy your books and so on. Be, don't be shy because the idea is to get each other's work as well. Richard, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Shadeep. And uh, thank you, Fiona, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, a pleasure to listen as well. Um, so this is uh, in your generous hours. Um, there's one word which you might not know. It's a kind of Scottish turkey, <laughs> not the poem, although you can judge that. Uh, uh, the the Kappa Kaley is, uh, it's a kind of Scottish turkey. Uh, it's quite rare. And it has this kind of mourning sound as in grieving. In your generous hours, in the plantation of focus group trees, allow the pine martin, the bumbling morning simple capicali, the crossbills glip glip. Allow the lips, the licks of sea lochs, the dribbling pouts of dams. Allow the crime of the bramble, the nettle spite. Give the light some latitude snagging in your lungs, the coffers have coffers, the kissed there kissed, allow to exist the ledge as a place of flowers, allow in your generous hours by the substantiated cities, the suburbs, they're off the hanger song, they're greed to belong, to pretend to the lens and breath of the country. Be friendly in dialects of body language telepathy. Assume trust with credulous fish, with defactoried cattle. Allow a little attar at the altar. Stay confidential with your future to the limits of scanners. Wipe the screen's bleary plate. Oh, you better not be late for enjoying the making of things. Make things. 
includes silence. Mm. You have a license to treasure affection in the diving chamber, to welcome partner from our recovery slumber, our plural known as lovers, to discover the places that happen to grow you up in, the schools and the schemes, the smokes and the smacks. Oh, you better relax. You're attached to the universe by the tenderest of chances. Make allowances. Allow me. And then the, the next uh, poem I'll uh, read. I, I, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, um, I work at the British Library where I'm the head of uh, contemporary British collections. So we collect sound and, um, and uh, manuscripts and also books. Yes, library books. Um, but what does a book mean? Is it, is it a digital thing now? Is it, uh, uh, is it parallel tracks? How do they work with each other? What are we made out of by them? Um, so this this is a book about that. Um, these choices are not choices. Urgency. And these choices are not choices, are not urgent. To cut your finger turning a page or to tire squandering pumped light. There is public private news and want, 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 without a fathomed angst. The screen disowns its imperatives. I have been compulsed, high frequency, low amplitude, a constant subpang for a friend and a data set. Our absence, our absence, absence or else. This push not to be, to be in your own absence. I love our long hours enfolded, sending, receiving, sending, receiving. No, thanks, praise, doesn't touch what touch is. Each euphoric sense, and I do say love, and I don't delete darkness. We transmit a very short distance. And sometimes we read. That's it, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Can you show, show us the covers of your books, please? That's Moon for That's Sale. That was the, the second poem from there. The second one, uh, the first one, <laughs> the second book, the first book. Uh, that's a lucky day. Mm. Yeah. Most of um, most of Richard's recent books are all published by Cockernet in the UK, so it's very easily available. Uh, he also edits um, an infrequent little magazine, which is very <laughs> difficult to get. It used yeah. to be that you had to send him a, a first class postage stamp as subscription and then he, you would get it. It was just fabulously quaint. I have some of the old ones because I knew him, he gave it to me. But I don't know whether it's still on. Is it, it does, do you still bring it out? Painted Fields, is it? Yes, yeah, so, it yeah, uh, nearly, uh, it was a long time ago. It, it's, it's Painted Spoken. And painted spoken. I, I, oh, I, right. produce, I produce less than 50, they're, they're printed. Um, and I like the idea of just exchanging, creating a kind of organic network through that. Um, and the idea is, is if you if you want to send two uh, second class stamps and a, an envelope, and I'll I'll just give it away. I just uh, underwrite that. Doesn't cost very much. It it feeds my obsession. Um, but I think I'll 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 make it. Um, there'll be a kind of digital version next year uh, on uh, painted spoken dot but it's still going to be printed it's not I like the idea of that exchange I like a slow poetry um, I am very much for digital it's rather I mean what, what we're finding with artist books at the library is that they're pausing complicating layering the codex uh, using digital uh, ideas and that they're not really um, opposed to each other they're really beginning to hybridize and complicate each other. 
um, in, in pretty interesting ways. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep those two things together. Um, I suppose I, I come out of an analog world to, to some degree. I think we all do. Um, and and uh, um, I still have naturalized that in, in my writing as I think many of us will have, but I, um, so it's analog onto a notebook still for, for poetry. Fiction is a little bit different, um, but um, I want to keep that in, in the magazines that I do. Thanks, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, so it's Don. Don the anchor. Welcome, Don. Thank you. I have two for you today. Sound quality is okay. Election day. Palmetto bugs perch dead still or fly right at you. The day after, I woke in the dark to a loud scraping. It was perched on a foam cup, rubbing its jaw on the lip. Another time, I cut one in half with a hoe. Both ends scrambled into the grass. <laughs> Indeed. The barbarism and co corporate madness of intercollegiate athletics continues through the pandemic. Sparrow generations. Brown offered a full ride on my tennis, MIT on academics. Even then I knew I want to learn in college. I have a choice. Chris Dolman, Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, the lucky athletes who soared to glory. Their generations passed through Pitt Stadium right outside my office window. I marveled as the Coliseum was demolished and one early morning at the end, when no one else was looking, the facade with the entrance gate fell, the last grand relic to come down, broke the street and the sewer beneath, and I finally understood that choice I made at 16. Now it's an event center, the peat, glass and concrete, food mall and Wi-Fi, Judas Priest and basketball, Foo Fighters, hockey and Disney on ice. Sometimes I ride up the escalator, mostly I walk, outdoors through the hedges, alive with birds, feral cats and groundhogs. Either way, you can't miss that vaulted interior, limitless ceiling, video wall like the side of a house, sports news constantly running, generations of trophied athletes displayed in locked cases like numbered Audubon prints or rare baseball cards. In the morning, I pass by the gym even at six, there are students on the treadmills, boys fit and massive, beautiful, girls fit and beautiful too. I see them on campus with their teammates, lounging and laughing, bruised and braced, casts and crutches. Often a bird strikes the peat windows in flight then lies still on the concrete till the janitor comes. Sometimes I carry one back to the hedges when it's been days. Last week, I saw a sparrow by the glass wall, 
standing on the concrete like a statue, even when I knelt beside it. I touched his belly, urged him, step up. He hopped over my finger, then turned and flew onto my hand. The life and quickness in that tiny body, the bright trust of a stranger. I slowly stood and walked him up to the hedges, urged him once more, and he flew free on to his own life. Thank you so much, Don. And uh, both, both Fiona and I want to, and Indran, we want to reiterate our thanks to Don because he really anchors all the technical things from sitting so far away and without him, we can't do whatever we're doing. Absolutely so, wonderful, yeah. Now from Dhaka, which is half an hour later from where I am, Aminur Rahman, who's a fine poet in Bangla, I've had the privilege of translating him over the years and he's translated my work. Um, I lived in Bangladesh for five years, so that's where our friendship grew. And of course he travels the world as he knows everybody in, in the world. If you need to know, if you need contacts of poets, talk to Raminur Rahman. <laughs> <laughs> Aminur, all yours. Welcome Aminur, it's wonderful to Thank see you. you. Thank you, Sudeep and Fiona. And yeah, yeah, you, you were right, Sudeep, actually, last 25 years, we are just, we know each other, and we did a lot of work together, a lot of projects, Sudeep and myself, 20 years back, and I think, yeah, we met, bent, also in the same, Sudeep, isn't it, in, in Medellin, in 20 years back, so yes. just see, 20 years, is the friendship is going on, mm -hmm. and the jury is there for long years, also, yeah, we know each other for uh, ten more than ten years, and what? Yes, I think we met Bengt at uh, in Medellin, Medellin. Yeah, exactly. We met in Medellin. Yeah. So this this is the friendship, and Fiona and I met in, in Kitova, I think two years back. So these are the friendship actually uh, for a long time, and and Victor, I know Victor and Indran and and Bagda is there also, and a lot of Zoran is there. So these are the yeah, this is the friendship for the poets. And which is because we here, uh, Shudip and Fiona, we have given the platform to exchange our poems to each other. So, and, 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 and we are working actually for the, uh, for the poetry act as an activist for long years. So it's a uh, friendship, it's long lived friendship. And I'm sure uh, we can do much better job in the future too. And I'm just, I want to uh, read one poem in Bangla first because this is the language of Rabindranath Tagore. So start with, uh, one small poem, and Shudip has translated that one. So I'm really acknowledging Shudip's uh, contribution of my first translation book long back, 20 years back. And the poem name is her sculpture, La Sculptura in Spanish. And in Bangla, it is Bhashkurjo. Suashar Shurir Kete Kete আমি তোমার শরীরে ভাস্কর্য করছি আজ সারা সকাল চোখ বুঝে বসে আছি চারপাশে কুয়াশার নিবিড় অস্তিত্ব আমার গাল কান নাকের উপর জমে যাচ্ছে সেই হাত সেই ঠোঁট সেই চোখ আমি ঠিক ঠিক পেয়ে যাচ্ছি জরুল জংহা জিতেন্দ্রিয় যান হবি মূর্ত হয়ে উঠছো তুমি আলোকে পিছে ফেলে কুয়াশার শরীরে সংবৃত আত্মার শেখুন ফ্রম দ্য মিস ডেনস্কেপ আই কার্ভ ইউর বডি শেপ জেন্টলি স্কাউটিং অল মর্নিং With my eyes shut, I see the mead, the fox heavy shapes as its frost settles on my cheek, ear, and nose. The same hands, the same lips, the same eyes. I find them with ease, such ease. 
your torch of flowers on the river. I shall conquer its flow. Your figure blossoms, freeing itself, leaving behind sun's light and fog's ephemeral body. You are entwined with my soul. Its root, limb, and depth. Yeah, Shudip. Yeah, Shudip done. It's quite, quite. Uh, because of whenever I just travel, no one has any any observation of the translation because of people say it's a wonderful translation. And Shudip always says, always says he teaches uh, the English, and he knows very, very actually translation. Shudip translation is very good translation. And recently, I've translated a few of uh, because I have a good translator in Bangla, and uh, that. I think I, I should if I have not sent you this book in this, I will take the privilege to show this book here. This is a big volume book of translation, my days and translation, last 35 years translation and 35 poets actually. And it is a 400 pages books translated in Bangla, Shudip and Brent is there and Yuri also there. And I'm sure in next edition, I'm sure all other poets who are here I, I really love to love to translate your poems in Bangla too. My next poem, Dimension of a Poem. As I search in the dark, I have finally caught hold of my poem. I'm not ashamed to say that I have been looking for a mount at least before this poem is lying in my grasp. This poem in my hand has the dimension of my loosely wrapped finger and I can feel its cool touch within. I have always seen a poem dancing with the wind, spreading fragrance all around. I have seen a poem on, on the leaves like the soft moonlight through, though never have I been able to craft even one. A poem has been around me like the tinkling sound of anklets. As I hear the resonance of the music, I'm looking for a poem in the music of the song. I have searched all around. Alas, could never find it. In the middle of the night, having suddenly woken up, hearing cries, I went anxiously looking for my poem. All I found was a salty, water-drenched pillow, but not a single trace of any poem. Now, finally, after many days, I had caught a poem in my grasp. And I wonder how long can I hold this poem in my closed palm. And as I open my palms, to gaze at them, but why? Where is the poem? All I found is the fossil of love in the hungry shape of my hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aminur. <clears throat> It's lovely to hear the Bangla actually, you know, that's, that's beautiful. And of course yeah. you have the music at the back as well. Yeah, three dimensions. Thank you so much, Emily. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Fiona. Thanks, Judy. And now we have, Edwin. yes, Edwin. You should, should pronounce your name, you know, it, it's, it's Malay, Tamil, Indian, American, PhD uh, from Nottingham. Well, Mal Malchai is uh, Jewish, uh, oh. Hebrew. Uh, last book from the Old Testament, Edwin, uh, I guess English, where the money, very Tamil, yeah. Uh, yep, we, thanks Shudi for this opportunity. Uh, we met many years ago in London. And then- Nottingham, we, Nottingham yes. actually. In London, per se, I think, and then in, you visited me in Nottingham, and then, of course, uh, 
back in when I was back in Malaysia, you were, you've come to the university, taken part in our Georgetown Literary Festival. I was happy to see you again in Bangalore for the Bangalore Poetry Festival. So um, I'm going to read two poems, uh, and they're quite contrasting poems in the sense that one is uh, a rather recent poem, one of my uh, pandemic poems. And the second one, uh, I thought it would be a bit more celebratory uh, since we are in the festive season of Christmas. So the first one is called, um, Another Morning Has Broken. I have awoken. The morning alarm is silent. My body doesn't understand these lockdown days. My phone lights up. Good morning greetings arrive as do Facebook notifications. I leave my bed, walk away from my cool bedroom. The morning sun is warming my hall. Soon an oppressing heat will awaken the air conditioner. The dogs have heard my movements. As I raise the kitchen blinds, Duke walks to the side grill door, expecting the first of his many treats. Princess follows his lead. The morning 20 minute exercise I promised myself is about to begin. I move in sync with the bodies on the TV screen. A voice rings out, walk, 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 stay healthy, you will stay young. I want to stay healthy, stay young. These virus ridden days, staying alive seems hard enough. My t-shirt is drenched. Salt water flows over my lips, slips into my mouth. I taste the burnt calories accumulated the night before. As I sip my first coffee of the day, I have crossed the first nine hours of another day. The remaining hours scream out, what are we going to do today? The same as we did yesterday and the day before. What day was it? I barely remember or care to know. Thank you. The second poem I'm going to read is from my first collection of poems entitled uh, Complicated Lives. And um, it's called One Christmas Morning. It's set uh, in my little village. It was a small village in Kuala Lumpur before Kuala Lumpur became gentrified. One Christmas Morning. The smell of curries and familiar kitchen sounds of party, Amma and my sisters have awakened me. My younger brother already about caught up with his presence open at midnight by the Christmas tree has no time for me. Anen has switched on the gramophone and Pat Boone sings carols that he'd be home for Christmas, though not my sister away in a distant land. The smells of curries and ghee rice walk through the house. Guests will arrive, but not yet. Appas come home his bicycle still laden with the day's newspapers. Offices closed for the holiday. Deliveries can wait another day. A brother's in the bathroom. Another waits his turn. Soon we'll all have bathed and dressed, and dressed in our Christmas best, ready for church, a quick walk away. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And finally, we have Yuri from Mexico City. And we have Yuri's bio at the side. But uh, Yuri and Aminur, uh, well, I think it's Yuri who's the director. And, um, and he's got all these country directors. And he's got a whole empire, a hierarchy of directors, about 50 directors. You know, a director in Hertfordshire, a director in Salt Lake City director of Asia, but no, I'm just putting his leg. He, he directs the World uh, uh, Festival for Poetry and they did a hundred continuous readings during lockdown, zone by zone, country by country, language by language. 
it was an incredible feat. I don't know how you Finishing. had the capacity and the tenacity to do it, but I think you guys did a wonderful job. And when you clocked 100, we all celebrated. So Yuri, and this is beyond the fact that he's a full-time doctor fighting the AIDS, uh, the corona yeah. epidemic in Mexico City. Yuri, all yours. Welcome, Yuri. It's really great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody, to the friends, and of course, giving a special gift to Don Krieger because he also works in neurons and the brain. So thank you, everybody, Victor, Catherine, Soran, Magda, Richard, Malak, Ben, Aminur, Tudor, Fiona, and Sudip. Thank you very much for everybody, Indran, and all the people. So I will read two poems. One poem is a mythological poem because I wrote, in, I am writing in mystical poems, and the other one is a political. So uh, the idea is the first one is this. Uh, sweet Tsunami. Sweet Tsunami uh, has an epigraph of John Keats, and I will continue. <clears throat> I am expecting, unveiling the clouds at dawn, some sounds of drums, sitar, and flute are telling me <clears throat> about your cute heartbeat. In Crete, an Iceland in Greece, Zeus and Europe sing with the beat. Half a bull, half a man, sacred anthems celebrating your courage. I am slowly hoping the sun rise. I know your hands will be traveling on my body and you and your look will be so sweet like a bird's harmonic tweet. I am preparing my heart for you. My warm skin is right now, open to your hands, to your pores, your smile, your self, your self and soul. Your active mind is now waiting the big surprise. The imagination is in your thoughts. It is not a dream. Suddenly, the Minotaur, all flesh, all sin, all transgression, launch forward your quintessence, your fundamental nature, and your fragrance flutes the atmosphere as a sweet tsunami. It is not a fantasy. You are feeling the real rush of these words, like a sword in your mind. Now you are crossing my world. You have knock down the almost unyielding gates of my heart. Your brain all the time is looking for new sensation. I am feeling the sweet tsunami on your carriages, close to me, over me, and a naive flush in your face, it makes me think that love is real. And the second one is a uh, uh, is translated by, by Jack Hirschman and is uh, about the women. So this, this month, as Sudip is saying, we will make other poetic action uh, from, from here. Today we are starting in Houston at the borderline Mexico, United States, and we will finish in February. And this is for women. So I will, I will, do, I will read a poem about the, the women, the second poem. Proposal, translated by Jack Kirchman. I propose a topic about an astounding women able to destroy unbreakable walls to reach our inner darkness, able to create more of 900 Eden's paradise, only to comfort the sadness for the loneliness, able to fight the terrible stories about perceptiveness of immortals, able to consolidate two separations to meet a new unbridled union, able to brighten endless roads with the audacity of her spirit, capable of breaking strong chains to beautify her home, capable to pour her soul in prosperous service of somebody else, 
able to give away her feelings for the deepest senses, even for a moment, able to deny her virtues because she knows her defects. I propose a topic about these virtues and astounding women because producing her echo, she can spread indeed the right weight of silent love. That's it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Sudip, for the invitation. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you for all you do. So it's getting really late, so I'm just going to cut short my two poems down to one and my one medium sized poem down to a very short poem. Or well, haiku, so to speak. <laughs> That's very modest and generous of you, Shadeep. And um, I hope you've put your bio in the um, chat. And naturally, I think we all know who you are and we all love your work, but it's great to hear you. Thank you. So this is, this is, um, this is a, a short poem called Kathag. And for the last 35 years, I've been obsessed with classical Indian music and dance. And one of the books I'm working on right now is called, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is going and go it's gone. One of the books I'm working on is a response to classical music and dance, and it, it's called The Whispering Anklet, uh, Payal, which is what you wear around the anklet. And this one is called Kathak. Kathak is one of the classical Indian uh, dance forms. And it's dedicated to this fabulous contemporary dancer called um, Aditi Mangal Das. You must check her out. I can put her link later on. Kathak. Deep, <clears throat> sorry, deep within the eyes of a dancer, irises and poems bloom. On her cupped, curled, coal-lined eyelids, similes smile. On each eyelash, metaphors arch, waiting to flutter. On her bosom's electric silk fabric, Secret lyrics are bloused. Her limbs slender extension tips, decant arias, tumri sing, soar, her balletic grace, liquid. She dances on water, always afloat. Even Kusro and Kabir, stunned, tongue-tied, searchingly compete to compose couplets for this dancer's next movement. Pupil wide-eyed, she cajoles, seeking her lover, hidden in the dancer's heart, the beloved quietly resides. Thank you. Well, we can, we can unmute. We can all unmute ourselves. And uh, thank you all so much for being here. And, um, you know, it's late for some of you, I know. And um, yeah, look, we are really looking forward to our season. And um, next year is going to be a packed one. Fiona, if you want to say something. What a wonderful start to what's going to be a really great season, I think. Um, just truly so. Um, well, so obviously so international and all the things that flow from that so many different kinds of poetry so many different concerns voices forms just that whole richness that you get from internationalism which just feels like doors opening doesn't it it's just wonderful so mm. i mean a huge thanks to everybody who's come to read again an extra thanks to don and to shadi for all the work behind the scenes um yeah. And to and to oh, Fiona okay. and Indran. And to all our colleagues and fellow poets. I mean, you know, really, we're all in it together. We are all in it together. We're writing together. We are singing together, singing in the dark times, you know, regardless of the dark times, we have to keep singing. Yes, this is the best part of the dark times we live in, or one of the <laughs> standpoints. Yes, it is. I agree. Yes. You know. yes. 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 Good, excellent. So good night. 
Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona and Shudip. Thank you very much. Ben, how are you? Patrick, Soran, Don Krieger, how are you? Zoran, are you Skype you? tomorrow. Zoran, uh, Skype tomorrow, maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Or Thursday, or would Thursday be better for you? Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. Okay, let's say Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, all right. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Thank Many thanks. All the best Good to you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.